Water is our most precious resource on Earth. It covers over 80% of our planet. And scientists believe that most of the water on Earth has been here for billions of years. As part of a vast recycling process known as the hydrologic cycle, water constantly moves between the oceans, the atmosphere, and the land. In Florida, there is no question that water is our most valuable resource. For the thousands of people who migrate to the state each year, it is often the beaches and the warm waters of the Atlantic that draws them. But as quickly as the coastal regions are being developed, they are exploding with populations that inevitably must move inland toward another precious water resource, Florida's rivers. There's no Floridian or no visitor to our state uh, who is not affected by our river systems. They represent a major source of our water supply. Our river systems are also one of our great uh, natural assets, a tremendous source of recreation. Uh, they are a protection uh, for the diversity of our wildlife. Uh, they are part of what defines Florida as the special place that it is. Florida has more than 1,700 rivers and streams, ranging in length from a half a mile to more than 500 miles. From clear, spring-fed waters like the Itchituckney, to the dark canopy banks of the Loxahatchee, to the one-of-a-kind river of grass known as the Everglades, each river is as unique as a human fingerprint. Thousands of years old, they have been quietly carving out their paths of life in harmony with the creatures and cultures that have inhabited their banks. Today, Florida's rivers are in danger. Dredged, filled, dammed, and drained, they're being caught between the competing interests of development, industry, agriculture, and conservation. The Swanee River is probably the most famous river in America, thanks to the song written by Stephen Foster. And to the citizens of this country, the Swanee is a river to be cherished and protected. But just whose job it is to provide that protection is a question as yet unanswered. You have the Swanee River Water Management District, you have DER, you have DCA, you have the counties, you have the state of Georgia, you have the Corps of Engineers. All of them have some stake, some interest in the management of the river. But there is no true, unified, comprehensive management plan for the Swanee. Uh, someone said some years ago that Swanee, the Swanee is everyone's sweetheart, but nobody's responsibility. Part of the problem for the Swanee is that it originates in Georgia in the Okefenokee Swamp. Industrial waste from the Nakusa packaging plant is dumped into a creek that feeds the Withlacoochee River a major tributary of the Suwannee. And when the waters cross the state line, Georgia's waste becomes Florida's problem. Up to this point, we have not been able to establish an effective dialogue with Georgia. We must do that. Half of the basin is in Georgia. The farming activities in Georgia impacts ultimately the Withlacoochee and the Suwannee. The discharges from cities ultimately impacts the Suwannee River. We've, we've tried to make some contacts, we haven't been successful. It's my belief that uh, the state, uh, the Department of Environmental Regulation, needs to move ahead to establish some formal mechanism where we can sit down and discuss what Georgia is doing to the Suwannee River and to the Withlacoochee River. Of course, the problem is when you're upstream, you don't worry about it so much because you're sending all of your bad stuff downstream. What Georgia puts into the water is far from being the only problem for the Swanee. I think what's killing the Swanee is uh, what I would call gradualism. Which is? Uh, it's uh, that the things that are happening individually are not large enough to make people scared of what's happening. Uh, but when you put them all together, one little house here, one little pizza joint there, a new restaurant, a new marina, a new development, a new this, a new that, a new program, it's. It's all taking up the bank. It's taking up the shoreline of the river. George Griffin is an environmentalist and avid canoeist who has spent the last 12 years 
fighting to protect the banks of the river from encroaching development. What you see behind me here uh, is uh, exactly the place where largemouth bass and uh, brim and all kinds of fish would be spawning. So every time you do this, you, you remove uh, the reproductive uh, capabilities of the animals that live in this river. Uh, they don't spawn out in the middle of the river with the exception of the sturgeon. They spawn back in the, uh, in the uh, river swamp. And that's what's gone here. The bank is gone. As the population increases, so does the recreational boat traffic. And that poses a danger to humans and animals alike. It's almost impossible for a, an avid canoeist to, uh, to come down in this area on the weekend and enjoy uh, you know, what they want to do. And also, it's a, it's a problem for small fishing boats and for anybody who are in small craft. But it's more than just a nuisance for the manatee that live in the river. The increase in boat traffic has become the number one killer of these gentle giants. In the summertime, the Crystal River herd uses the river extensively, and they come up in this area to birth. Uh, we've had, for the last three years in a row, uh, we don't know about this year yet, we have lost our, our young uh, that have been born up in this area. The Suwannee is the last river in Florida with a viable population of sturgeon, a primitive species of fish estimated to be some 250 million years old and once abundant in the rivers of the south. They can grow to be 15 to 20 feet long and weigh as much as 2,000 pounds. Harvested for almost a century for their meat and valuable caviar, they're now considered endangered. Sturgeon researcher Steve Carr has been working on the Suwannee for the past three years. It's reaching its limits now as far as it's the natural biota, what they can stand. Um, the bass are contaminated with mercury, and uh, oysters are contaminated. And uh, Luckily, the sturgeon don't feed in the river, so all they need is a quiet place to rest for six or seven months out of the year. And, uh, that's all they're asking of the river. So being a valuable resource, uh, it would be easy to maintain this population by just minimal care of the river. The economic ramifications of the condition of the river are most obvious in the estuary, where the river meets the Gulf of Mexico. If a county or two counties or three counties decide to do something, we have no control of stopping what they put in the river, and it ends up down here, and we live with it. Rivers are the lifeblood of estuaries, and the estuaries produce all the organisms that uh, the Gulf of Mexico depends on, the recreational and sport fisheries, uh, the shellfish populations. Um, many of the, the marine animals need these types of river deltas as far as uh, early life history in order to support um, populations. I liken it into the river being a woman, and if the woman's health is good, she'll put forth good, healthy children, and that's what this estuarine area is to me. It's the place where all the seafood is born. Not far from the Georgia line on the river is Big Shoals, Florida's best example of a true whitewater rapid. Just below Big Shoals is the quaint town of White Springs, home of the Stephen Foster Cultural Center. The economic base of the community was once tourism, when the spring waters were touted to have healing powers. But today, the land around the springs provides the jobs for this community. Occidental Chemical Company has leased almost 100,000 acres of the mineral-rich land and is strip mining it for phosphate. But some think the price for these jobs is too high. It's a short-term benefit to the county, not a long-term benefit, because they're going to be left with more or less the, the uh, moonscape image, which is how you often hear phosphate mining described. Um, we don't know 
how those how useful those lands are going to be, but they certainly are not going to be very useful to the Swanee, which I think is the biggest thing that the counties along the river have going for it. So when when Oxy leaves in, in uh, 15 or 20 years or maybe less than that, then Hamilton County um, is going to be left with a, a lot of area up there that is not going to be provide economic benefits to them. And if we do not want dirty rivers, if we do not want dirty air, and we do not want our children to have a heritage that has little or no value and a very limited and low quality of life, we're going to have to say no. They like to euphemistically say no to drugs. I say we should learn to say no to what I call the five dastardly or four dastardly Ds, and that's the diggers, dammers, dumpers, and developers who don't give a damn. As a river, the Suwannee itself is a Creek or Muscogee word which means echo. Suwannee means echo in Muscogee. And Suwannee, as an echo, may only be that in the future, unless people who profess to care actually do something. The Peace River is, as its name implies, serene and tranquil. But its name disguises its vulnerability. Its headwaters near Bartow are fed by Lake Hancock, one of the most polluted lakes in the state. But it flows on, past the phosphate mines that in the past have devastated the river, through ranch lands and pastures, between densely forested banks, it narrows and then spreads as it eventually joins the Gulf of Mexico at Port Charlotte. The longest river in the state, it's a favorite for canoeists. All of the people who come to visit, we have brochures scattered everywhere that say, see the real Florida. All the tourists are eventually making it to us too, but basically our people are Florida people wanting to get away from the city for the weekend. Uh, they want to get back to see Florida as it really is and get back to nature. And the Peace River, of course, is almost totally uninhabited and there's plenty of great places to stop. They don't get hassled a lot when they're on the river. The river is rich with artifacts and history, at one time forming the boundary between the Indian and white areas of settlement in Florida. Nearby Fort Meade was the site of one of the last skirmishes of the Second Seminole War in the mid-1800s. Today, the river faces another battle. The need for, for fresh water. Uh, it's a critical situation in the state of Florida, and a lot of people look at river systems as a potential source of fresh water. And, and rather than let it flow into the Gulf of Mexico, stop it, retain it, uh, so, store it so it can be used by more people. That is the big conflict and the big war that's, that's yet to be fought. At present, the river is serving several masters. In the upper portion, rich phosphate deposits are being mined near the river's banks, creating the same problems the Suwannee faces. The city of Arcadia uses the river for its wastewater treatment facility. And, ironically, downstream at Port Charlotte, that same water is being pulled out of the estuary to serve a growing demand for drinking water. What happens if we do decide to do that, if we look to the rivers as a, as a drinking supply rather than trying to retain their natural state? Well, you wind up with a reservoir. We have many reservoirs in the country. Florida has a number of reservoirs. And the big thing that happens is it, it switches from being a river to being a lake. Um, lakes offer a lot of recreation. They have water uh, storage capacity. Um, but you do lose the river. And the river is important to a lot of people. It's important to a lot of species of wildlife that don't live in lakes. And also you have problems with a lot of reservoirs. I think we can look at Rodman Reservoir. We can look at some of the other systems in the state that have been impounded. And they're plagued with problems and they need to be managed. So uh, just putting a dam up doesn't solve your problems. A lot of times it starts many new problems. And that is a statement to which lovers of the Oklawaha River will attest. The Rodman Dam stands in the river as a monument to the ill-conceived Cross Florida Barge Canal project. Had the project been completed, much of the river would have been incorporated into the canal. But environmentalists and concerned citizens said no. And in 1971, President Nixon halted the construction. By then, however, the Rodman Dam was a reality. When they were building the, the reservoir, there was such a rush to get it done that they just smashed 9,000 acres of floodplain forest into the mud. There was very little salvage. They didn't go in and cut any lumber. 
They just had this huge crawler crusher bulldozer and just smashed it all down into the mud. And uh, wood floats, so every, you know, it keeps popping up to the surface. As organic matter continues to build up on the bottom of the reservoir, the lake is slowly becoming a marsh. Marjorie Carr, president of the Florida Defenders of the Environment, sees the Rodman Reservoir as an unnecessary expense. Take fishing. Take fishing if you want to. The whole sports fishing industry. Um, the Octawaha, as a free-flowing river, provides all of that free. No maintenance at all. Now, if you want to make an artificial pool and cope with it, then you can put out a million dollars a year. The dam has interfered with several natural occurrences. You don't have the, the fish migration that you had before. You know, striped bass coming in and catfish up and down for spawning. Um, the manatees can no longer use the, the river as easily. They still go through the locks and occasionally they catch one and squish it in the, in the lock um, gates. But the greatest impact of the dam is its alteration of the natural floodplain of the river. Whereas before you had all these a continuous floodplain forest for flood control. As the water came up during periods of heavy rain, it would go out into the floodplain. Uh, the trees would slow the water down. It would slowly drain off. You know, and by doing this, you have a, fl a flushing action of the floodplain and the river. You don't have that now with the dam in place. I take quite a few people canoeing on this river who are not real outdoors type folks, hoping to enlist their love and concern and, and efforts towards protecting this river and trying to get them to feel the same way about it that I do. I love the alligators, I love the birds, the ones you hear singing around us. I can come out here and commune with myself and with nature and with the Lord and in peace and quiet. And uh, I would love to leave this behind in better condition than it is now for people who will be coming along behind me. Flowing through 66 miles of Sarasota, Manatee, and Charlotte counties, the Mayaka River is perhaps the best example of a cooperative effort to preserve a river for the generations to come. This generation will probably impact the river more than any other preceding generation. And at the same time, this is the generation that's going to have to bite the bullet and is going to make a contribution in terms of putting the proper planning mechanisms in place putting in place the proper water and land management mechanisms uh, if succeeding generations are going to have any kind of a, a hint of what this uh, beautiful river and basin can, uh, uh, can supply. In an attempt to meet those goals, the Florida legislature created the Mayaka River Management Coordinating Council in 1985. The council, made up of representatives from every facet of the community, attempts to address the different needs of the people who use the river, as well as the river itself. In the past, landowners have been wary of government involvement. The coordinating council is changing that. Since its first inception in the late 1970s, uh, I think any private landowner uh, kind of is afraid through lack of communication of any any agency, any governmental agency that moves in is going to change things. We basically don't like changes. That's a human nature. Uh, after being on the commission for th three years uh, and through communications, my viewpoint is certainly tapered down quite a bit than, than what we were meeting before. 
Obviously, one of our challenges in coming up with a, a management plan for the river is trying to take into account the activities in the entire basin without making it so onerous or burdensome on the users in the basin that either A, there's no political consensus to do it, or B, it's just not practical. This is, um, this is a grand experiment, this management of this river. And if, uh, if people can uh, sit down and communicate and, uh, and share with each other their expectations, their needs, their constraints, opportunities, and work together to develop a meaningful plan that is implemented uh, politically and uh, from a budgetary standpoint, I think we can demonstrate how things can be done right. If they succeed, areas like this extraordinary rookery, home to the endangered wood stork, stand a chance of survival. I think that people protect what they have a personal relationship with, their homes and their, their children and their jobs. And I think to make people concerned about protecting rivers, they have to develop some kind of personal relationship with rivers. It helped me begin a career as a conservationist, as an outdoor writer. And uh, what I think it's importance now is that if you don't have this type of experience when you're growing up, you won't be the type of person that will contribute to the protection of these areas later. One of the things that environmentalists are up against is an environmentalist can win a battle a hundred times and lose it once and it's lost forever. This river is unique in all the world and uh, it's worth saving. Florida's only nationally designated wild and scenic river, Biloxahatchee, is a subtropical paradise in the midst of urban sprawl. It's sort of like the gem that's remaining in Palm Beach County, and for that reason, it's very important. Its national designation as wild and scenic affords it certain protections against encroaching development not shared by other rivers in the state. But still, it feels the impact of the surrounding community. This area will eventually be entirely surrounded by urban development, which introduces heavy metals. It introduces a, a flood problem because the water rushes out of people's yards and, and that sort of thing. They don't want it to stay in the supermarket uh, parking lots. They want to get it down to the drain. Stormwater runoff is always a major problem, and it has to be controlled before it enters the river and not after. The neatest thing about it is the, the tropical component that we don't have any place in, uh, in the national system of scenic and wild rivers. It's all the real neat vegetation that comes from the tropics as well as the blending of some of the temperate vegetation. So the river does have an extreme diversity that a lot of the national rivers do not have. Because of that diversity and its national designation, more and more people are discovering the Loxahatchee, and that in itself poses a challenge to the river's caretakers. The one thing we are going to try to do within uh, Department of Natural Resources and Florida Park Service is try to control the use of the river so that people will call and they can, they can go ahead and get times to go down river uh, so they can, if they want a, a nice, ex quiet experience, they can get it. And also, if they want to go with their friends as a group, they can also get that experience. Limiting the recreational use of Florida's rivers is a concept being considered all over the state. The Blackwater River in the Florida Panhandle has some of the purest water in the nation. And since most of it flows through the Blackwater River State Park, industrial pollution and runoff pose less of a threat to it than the people who are drawn to its pristine waters.
East of the Blackwater, not far from Lake City, is the popular Ichituckney River. Not long ago, this river was in danger of actually being loved to death. At one time, as many as 3,000 people or more tubed, canoed, and swam the river on any given day. But as vegetation and wildlife began to disappear, officials were forced to restrict the number of people on portions of the river to the current limit of 750 per day. What we're going to do is look at that impact over the next several years and see if the vegetation can hold its own. And we're not concerned just with the vegetation, we're concerned with the creatures that depend on the vegetation, obviously. Uh, so we're going to be looking at several different facets and we'll determine that in several years down the road, if 750 is a suitable number. It's a delicate balance that must be struck between the people and the environment. And though several years down the road may find the river in a healthier state, it may also find people like Linda Soriety out of business. I um, don't make but about half as much as I did last year, which I, at that time, I just made enough to make my land payment and have a little bit to live on, the basics. And this year, it's going to be really tight. Striking that delicate balance is the challenge facing the state of Florida today. And it's a challenge from which we can't afford to back down. Because if we do, we stand to lose the most important resources we have, our fresh water supplies and the life forms they support. Wildlife can't exist without water naturally, and it can't exist without the habitats provided by the river systems. The, the uh, hardwood swamps that line our rivers, the mangrove communities, uh, everything in Florida basically depends on rivers. Uh, also the corridor systems that rivers provide. They provide an area for wildlife to move along the rivers, along the river banks, uh, to move from area to area. The corridors are necessary not only for the migration of wildlife, but for the protection of the rivers themselves. The Save Our Rivers program set up under the Graham administration in 1981 was a major step toward protecting our water resources. That program provided the water management districts in Florida with a stable funding source which they could use to acquire the environmentally sensitive lands that surround and protect our rivers. The Save Our Rivers program has been one of the most extensive land acquisition programs of any state in the nation for purposes of protecting its rivers. Uh, we have spent an average of $40 million a year since 1981 for river protection in Florida. Uh, it has brought into public ownership uh, most of the area around our major rivers, such as the Suwannee, the Apalachicola. Uh, but it will take more than money to accomplish the goal of saving our rivers. Certainly the cooperation of government, industry, and development are necessary, but the key to the success of these efforts is personal involvement. Oftentimes you'll go over a bridge and you'll say, oh, there's the river, and maybe once or twice a year you go down and fish or get on a uh, tube or a canoe or something and, and enjoy the resource. But there isn't the relationship, the, the sense of, gee, that's a resource that needs protecting. The individual homeowner that has a house nearby here that puts too much fertilizer on his yard needs to understand that that causes damage to our waters. Now, if he doesn't get out here and see what he could be damaging, then what's to make him understand why he shouldn't do that? There was a bumper sticker I saw the other day that I really liked. It was, uh, uh, think go globally, act locally. The more I paddle, the more I l love what I'm around, the, the environment. And it's just, you see things that you won't see any place else. You can't see them walking down your street. They're very unique to the rivers, uh, both uh, vegetation and uh, wildlife. Get out and enjoy it.